Ed actually had a hint of what of the concept that we're going to use to come up with the best estate plan. The legal word for this concept is called disclaimer. And what disclaimer is, it's a concept in the law that says you can't force anybody to accept a bequest. So let's say that Ed says, I name my wife as the beneficiary of my will, okay? We can't force Ed's wife to take it. She can say, I don't want it. Let's say that Ed in his will says, I leave everything to my wife, and she says, I don't want it. Where does the money go? Does she get to say, I don't want it? Give it to Joe, I don't want it, give it to Sue, I don't want it, give it to the gardener. She can't do that. If she doesn't want it, what we have to do is we have to go back to Ed's will and says, usually, by the way, it would be what happens if she's dead, if Ed's wife's dead. In my wills, I anticipate the possibility that she doesn't want it. So then, who would be the second choice? Well, in my world, uh, that second choice might be the B trust that I had mentioned, that I don't like, but I still want as an option. So the first, the, the key to the disclaimer is having multiple contingent beneficiaries. The first one I would typically name the B trust. The second one, I will typically name Ed's kids. The third one, I would name Ed's grandkids. And we have this in place while Ed and his wife are still kicking. Because the problem with naming kids or grandkids is what if the market goes down and Ed's wife needs it? We made a mistake. Please do. I have, this is my will, in a sense. But my wife can disclaim it, but she can take part of it if she wants. And that's I have a, two million. She can say, all right, I just want the million. And the other million go to the people. That, that is a very good point, is that it's not an all or nothing deal. Ed's wife can, if she wanted, if, if Ed has it the way I'm recommending, which is the beneficiary of his will or, or revocable trust, and even IRAs and retirement plans, although I don't use this for the IRAs, but we could have Ed's wife as the first beneficiary. We could have the trust that I mentioned that I don't like, that I just want to have as a safety valve as a second beneficiary. We could have his kids as the third beneficiary, and the grandkids as the fourth beneficiary. Ed, I need a little bit more help on the rest of your family. Does your oldest have any kids? All right, and what about the middle one? Three. Three, all right. So in my world, we're going to name Ed's wife as the primary beneficiary. At Ed's death, if she wants or needs it all, end of story, she gets it, period, we're done. But let's say that she doesn't want or need it all. She can say, hey, I disclaim. Why would she disclaim? Well, maybe she's worried about estate taxes. What happens to some of the money she disclaims? Well, it goes into that trust where she gets the income. Let's say she says, hey, I don't even want the income. Now there's no purpose to the trust. So who's next in line? Ah, the three kids equally. All right? So, and let's, let's keep it simple. Let's say a third, a third, a third. All right, this one's the strongest. Let's say this one says, hey, Jim Lang explained to me how beneficial it would be for my kids if I disclaim the IRA. And because I'm doing well on my own, I don't need it. And since it's worth two or three times as much money to my kids as it is to me, I will disclaim. And by the way, Ed was bright enough to have something in his will that if I disclaim, that is, if Ed's child here disclaims his portion of the IRA, that we have those special trusts that I mentioned that meet the five conditions for the benefit of these kids. 
And in my documents, I even anticipate that he's going to be alive so he could even be the trustee of that money. In most documents, the only way these guys get any money is if this one is dead. All right? I'm anticipating the possibility. Now, does this one want to benefit his nieces and nephews? No. He wants to benefit his kids. So I'm going to have a trust for his kids for his portion. For this one's portion, he doesn't want to benefit these guys. He wants to benefit his kids. So I'm going to have a trust for the benefit of these kids for two possibilities. One, he either predeceases Ed and his wife, or two, he doesn't need it all. I'm going to do the same for the third one. Now let's say Ed says, oh, the, the oldest, that, he really needs the money. He'll never disclaim. Great. What harm is it to have it here? And we use special language that has held up very well through the years that is designed to give Ed's ch child, each, each one of these kids gets to do whatever they want with their share, which could be keep, disclaim, or as Ed pointed out, some of each. Must be in the will, though. It must be. It, you, you have to have language of what happens if the person doesn't want it. So that's why you can't do this after somebody dies if you don't have the right documents set up. All right? Then you're in what we call catch-up mode, which is, you know, it's already flubbed. You try to do the, or I'm sorry, clean-up mode. It's already flubbed. Somebody dies. Now what's the best you can do? I can't tell you I haven't been there, because I have. Not with documents that I've drafted. Um, by the way, I'll tell you the, the the biggest problem that I'm having right now, and I hate to say it, but it was, it was an engineer who went to my workshop. He got it. He didn't want to pay the freight. He figured, ah, what I have is OK. And he was the same with his investments. He did all his investments by himself. He lost his shirt. He died. Virtually all the money went to the trust. And now the spouse is not sufficiently provided for, even though there's enough money there. She'll never starve, health maintenance support, but it's, it's really a mess.